Hey guys, Titzel here with the Econ Buff Podcast. You're about to hear episode three with Dr. Rex Pieski. In this episode, we're covering transaction costs. We both take a lot of our ideas and examples from the work of Michael Munger. His book is Tomorrow 3.0, which we highly recommend that you check out. Hello and welcome to the Econ Buff Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Stitzel. With me today is Dr. Rex Pieski, a economics professor at West Texas A&M, and our first multi-time guest. Rex, welcome to the yeah. Econ Buff. Thank, thanks, Lee. I'm glad to be here. So our topic today is transaction costs. So this is a topic that is of increasing importance, and yet when you look backwards in time, you see people have been talking about it in the field uh, for a long time. So Rex, define for us what transaction costs are. Well, a, a transaction cost is going to be any cost that's incurred with an exchange. So, it, you know, it could be, uh, you know, a travel cost. It could be the cost of contract. So, you know, any, any additional cost that's incurred by buyers or sellers to actually make an exchange is going to be what economists call transaction costs. So if I go and I purchase something and I pay something for that good, that's the price itself and any other cost is transaction yes. cost. Yes. So, so if have you have to right? go, you know, if you have to go buy it, you know, if you have to drive to the store to buy it, pay shipping, those are all transaction costs. So one of the interesting things about transaction costs is it's not just out of pocket. When I'm teaching econ, I always think about how do I get students to understand that costs are many things. Uh, you know, So for example, I'm thinking about um, buying the new iPhone whenever that comes out. There are a lot of transaction costs related to that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when you buy a new phone, you've got to transfer your stuff. Um, that's a over cost. to the new phone. Um, if you know the iPhone's an interesting example, that's a lot easier than it used to be. I remember S when I bought my first smartphone and I switched from a flip phone, and they had to take the chip out and download mm -hmm. the data, and I'll do all that. You, didn't, you don't have to do that with new iPhones. Yeah, I remember. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd listen to friends or be on Facebook five or six years ago, and you'd have people say same things like, well, I just got a new phone, so I lost all my contacts, so please text me your, your contacts. And you don't see that anymore because yeah. now it's, you know, Apple or Google or whoever you, whoever you deal with, they, 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 they make that easy for you. So, you know, last time I got a new phone, I basically just went to the store and picked it up, and it, it, it took me a few minutes, and that's a transaction cost. But, um, you know, my, my, my new phone looked like a new phone, and, and, and everything was on there when I started. It, all my contacts were on there and, and, and everything else. So I could have got my apps and stuff on there too, but whenever I get a new phone, I always like to just start completely fresh and, and download what I need. I don't want it to look like my old phone or I wouldn't get a new one. That's amazing. The last time I bought a new phone, it's been a while now. My phone's a couple years old. Um, I, I did the whole, the whole thing, all the apps, all the contact, everything went over. So I opened it up and it was almost like disconcerting that I have this thing that's now slightly different shape than the one I had a minute ago, but it has all the pictures, all the apps in all the places that I had them. It probably had to all my text message conversations seamlessly brought over. Uh, that's almost terrifying. But yeah, that, no, that's absolutely. So I was thinking about this. We have transaction costs. Weigh in on this for me. Do you think that a lot of cases the transaction costs are almost as big as the price of the thing that you're you're buying? Oh, I, I think that's I think that's often the case. Um, I think that I think that's I think that's often the case. Uh, I mean, I think it, I mean it certainly used to be perhaps with the with the phone. Yeah, it, it it was because you know the the you know what, what's what's important to you about 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 your phone are all the contacts and everything else. So when you buy a new new piece of hardware, whether it's a new computer or whether it's a phone or something like that, you know one of your biggest concerns is 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 this going to work? As good as my as good as my old one does, you know, especially if you're trading off something that still works yeah. uh, reasonably well. If you're just if you're just upgrading because you because you want to because you want to upgrade, but um, you know, transaction costs, you know, regardless of how how large they are compared to the price of something, transaction costs on on a lot of relevant margins, um, you know, to talk like an economist, really turn out to be critical. Uh, to a lot of the decisions that 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 we make, so so transaction costs can still be relatively small compared to like say a thousand dollar iPhone or something like that, but but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be um, that they're not going to be essential to our decision making process because on the margin um, on the margin they might be an extremely big deal uh, even compared to the even compared to the overall price 
of, 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 of the item. So whether you're talking about consumers or whether you're talking about firms, uh, I think transaction costs is, is one of the things that, that goes a long way into uh, basically explaining the world that we see, explaining the marketplace and how it exists, um, how it exists for us. Let's expand on that idea of ta- uh, making decisions on the margin because that's something really fascinating. So I, I'm sitting around and I'm trying to decide what I want to do for dinner. And I can either make myself a peanut butter jelly sandwich or I can drive over to Chick-fil-A. And the price of the Chick-fil-A relative to the amount that I enjoy that might be pretty high. And a, the PBJ is fine. Um, and then I end up making myself the sandwich because I don't want to drive to Chick-fil-A. So if you're not thinking about transaction costs, you look at the decision that I just made and you were like, it's something about the price of the Chick-fil-A is going to cost me 8 or 12 bucks or whatever it is there that drove me to not make that decision. But really, I'm just lazy and I don't even get off the couch right now and get in the car and go deal with traffic. That, that's really fantastic in terms of thinking how do people make decisions? If you just look at the price, it's a thousand dollar iPhone, it's a twelve dollar uh, box of chicken nuggets. You you really miss something if that's the only thing you look at. Right. I mean, I, I mean exactly. Uh, you know, again, transaction costs are. I mean, they they they're, they're pervasive. All right. They have to do with 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 everything uh, concerning the concerning the world. So, I mean, this is a different topic, but, you know, probably the two things that explain almost everything that we see are transaction costs and price discrimination. So, and, you know, price discrimination, that's the other, that's the other conversation um, that, that you could have with someone. But, um, you know, I, I think that transaction costs is, is, is something that is so uh, important to all of our decision-making purposes, especially among firms. I think, um, um, you know, certainly. But, you know, when I was going through school, we didn't really talk about them very much. It, it, was, it, 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 uh, it was something that, at least in, in the classes that I took, that I remember, wasn't really mentioned, wasn't really mentioned a, a lot. Well, Brian Kaplan thinks that you were probably taught it and you just forgot. But no, that might be true. That so might be true. For the listeners at home, let's talk about what price discrimination is really briefly in case they don't have their econ textbook handy. Okay, well, pri- uh, price discrimination would just be uh, um, a, a seller charging different customers different amounts for the same good. So in order to price discriminate, a, a, a firm w- would be able to charge customers with higher demand, a higher price than customers with, with, with lower demand. So we draw our little supply and demand graph and we say, oh, well, the price of the prevailing market price is this or it's that. And then our Econ 101 students go forth from our classes and think that that's how, that's how it works. And then now all of a sudden we're adding these two things on there. And those two things, especially combined, are probably as powerful as that fundamental supply and demand graph that we drew. Um, so that's really, that's really something wild. So we've, we've talked about transaction costs and we've kind of mentioned what do you see transaction costs being uh, primarily composed of? All right, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, sort of a practical application. You know, why, why, are, you know, why are transaction costs important? Then we can, you know, talk about exactly what, what they might be, what might, might be composed of. And so, you know, th- you know think about a, a firm, and, and really what defines the limits of a firm, uh, again, I'll use the same language I did before, on many relevant margins, is, is, is transaction costs. So, um, you know, a firm is an entity that does certain business, all right, uh, that, that, sells, that sells certain things. But there are all kinds of things, all kinds of activities that make that firm go that the managers or owners of the firm can decide to do with um, in-house labor, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. you know, s- s- uh, an employee that they have hired uh, to be sort of on retainer. Uh, and then there are all kinds of things that they can contract out to, to, to various degrees. And, and that, that decision to handle things in-house for a firm and to contract things out for a firm or to get some other firm or some other arrangement, uh, um, you know, to, to help the firm do its business, that defines the limits of the firm. And those limits are almost always determined by, by, by transaction costs. So let me give you an example of how that, of, of, of how that might work. 
um, you know, sort of sort of a, an example that, that that's 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 important because a firm could could very easily go go e- either way. Um, you know, a medium sized firm with maybe you know twenty to fifty employees would have to make the decision how we're going to keep the building clean. All right, and there's that they could hire a custodial staff. Or maybe just one custodian, if you know, depending on the size of the building. Or there are firms out there that specialize in in commercial cleaning. So the the the, the manager of the firm would would make that decision based on the transaction costs. Because if you hire your own custodian, all right, you've got to monitor that custodian. Um, you know, that's sort of the disadvantage. But the advantage of of hiring your own custodian is is that you have the individual in house. Right. All right, and you don't have to you don't have to make a complicated contract with the with with the custodian. So uh, the custodian would just clean the things on a schedule and and to the extent of what you wanted him or her to to do. All right, it's it's very very easy. If you do the outside custodial service, then you've got all these complicated uh, contracts that you have to write. How often do things get cleaned? If something needs immediate attention, how do you handle you know how do you handle that? Um, you know how clean uh, how clean are things supposed to you know s- supposed to be? So uh, is is every night the the place pristine, or uh, is is every night uh, when it's cleaned is it just sort of you know you know somewhat somewhat clean? So so there are degrees and 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 you know custodial contractors you know people that do this for for many many different different firms they have these kinds of they have these kinds of contracts well the, the, there's a cost to making those contracts there's a cost to making those contracts and and how difficult those contracts are to make will determine whether or not a firm will have an outside or an inside custodian. All right, there are other things that I think are a little bit more easy. You know, say like you and I's job, it would make very little sense for WT to contract us as faculty members. They want us in-house, all right, so to speak. All right, they want us to be full employees of, of, of the university, all right? That way, uh, the, um, you know, the contracts that they have with us are very, very easy, all right? The only thing you have to do to us then is monitor us, all right, to make sure that we're teaching our classes the way that we're uh, supposed to be teaching to, to, you know, make sure that we're doing our doing our jobs. But, you know, if you've got an in-house faculty to teach your classes, then then all of the other administrative work that you might need faculty to do, like accreditation issues and stuff like that, if you need help, it's very, very easy for the firm, in this case, the university to just go grab faculty members and get and get that and get that work done. All right. On the other extreme, you you know a, a, a lot of things that firms do um, is is completely contracted out uh, to the point where it's not even a contract. All right, the 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 microphones that we are talking into uh, to do this podcast were just simply bought by the university. There's no contract involved. The university needed microphones for podcasts, and so they just went to a store or to a catalog or whatever internet or wherever, and they just bought them. All right, and they were delivered. All right. You know, theoretically, uh, a business could make their own microphones, could make their own furniture, could make their own computers, or could rent stuff them. like that, or could or could even or could even rent them. Th- which that is would a, be the alternative, probably here. Right. right? That, is, that would be an alternative we could, here. We, we could we could rent our professors, and we could rent our microphones, and then we would have to on a per use basis. Right. So, so so the so so the important the, the important point here is. Uh, the important point here is, is that is that these transaction costs, regardless of how they manifest themselves, are going to establish the limit of the firm. All right. So you've got this big, vast marketplace out there with all of these activities, um, all of these activities that, that happen within it, and 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 the local. The, the locusts, there are locusts or nexus or whatever you would want to call them within that marketplace that we call that we call firms. All right. So they're almost like bubbles where inside these firms uh, activities take place. All right. So the firm, you know, provides education services or sells insurance or, or you know, sells groceries or, or whatever a firm might might do. And, and once you cross that barrier from the vaster marketplace into that firm, all right, you, you basically have. You, you basically have an entity that is a is is a command entity, right? Where you've got an ownership structure, you've got a management structure, and everybody inside that bubble basically does what they're told. All right, the the, the firm might have a mission, and 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 there's all of these devices to to sort of, for lack of a better word, um, uh, control or command, uh, to use another 
uh, economics um, e economics term, the activities of the control. So you've got a manager and the employer and the employees. Uh, to put it really, really simply, just do what the just do what the manager says. All right, and that's that's the contract that exists in 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 in, in those areas. And outside that you've got this wider marketplace where everything is governed by the price system. Inside the firm, there's very little, uh, there's very little use of prices. Outside the firm, there's lots of uses of, 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 of prices. Well, well, that barrier is determined by transaction costs because the price system itself costs, costs resources, costs money to use. So firms on the margin are making, are making a decision. Do I want this activity to be done in-house or do I want to contract it or some other way get it from outside the firm in, 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 the, larger, in the larger marketplace? And that decision is, again, is determined by transaction costs. So fundamentally, we think we could have this economy Everybody works for themselves, and they get their hands on different physical resources and different talents and abilities they have. And then we go around and we get things that we want to be made, and they somehow weave their way through this broad marketplace. But that doesn't make sense because the transaction cost it takes to organize those different resources and talents together is incurs a lot of transaction costs. Firms are a way to determine which of those things need to be grouped together to produce certain things in a way that we uh, deal with the transaction costs most effectively. That's, I mean, that's exactly right. So one definition of firms, and it wouldn't be the only definition of, of a firm, all right, but one definition of a firm would be a firm is an entity that economizes on transaction costs. Yes, yeah, that's beautiful. All right, so, so, you know, it makes the, you know, the firm makes the determination what is done in sort of a command and control type environment and what is done using the decentralized market system, the, the price, the price system. So I, I really want to come back around to that, but I had another idea coming back to the uh, previous, uh, not previous talk of it, but what we're just talking about now is we don't, as a firm, we don't want a microphone. I want access to the service that a microphone provides. I don't want access to a professor who can teach classes. I want a stream of services that teaches these classes. Now, it just so happens in both of those cases, it's much easier to contract them long term or to buy them outright if we're talking about the microphones to have access to those resources as opposed to needing in theory, I could organize every single lecture for every single class independently, and I could contract that out. The transaction cost would be enormous mm -hmm. because I'd have to communicate, and I'd have to organize, and I would have to barter, you know, not barter, but like negotiate a contract. So that's the same as we see um, sort of commonly discussed in some of our more retail or individual consumer settings. I don't want to own a hammer, right? I want right. to drive this nail into the wall so they can hang my picture. So right. firms are the exact same. Right. Uh, and I think that's a good, I think that's a good trans transition. So, you know, what, what, what really I think is more interesting, interesting today and, you know, 2019, you know, today's date is how reductions in transaction costs are changing the lives of, of, of consumers. Uh, you know, of course, the flip side of that is they are introducing new opportunities for firms to exist as I exist as well. But to you know, to sort of get there, I, I think that you have to understand how transaction costs um, affect structures of structures of firms. So you know, whether or not you're a, a university wanting a service of a microphone or a computer, or, or whether or not you're you're a consumer uh, wanting the services of a, of a drill or a hammer. Or a, an automobile, um, you know, uh, you know, even a car, or, or, or something like that. Um, um, you know, understanding transaction costs, I think, give great insight into in the decisions that consumers make. Consumers make as well. So, so let's let's take the the the, the example of, of a power drill. And the power drill is 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 what's used often in the literature. So that's what we can talk about. That's what we can talk about here as well. But but you know, you you don't want to own a drill. Uh, for the purposes of owning a drill, so you don't get, um, um, you know, any satisfaction hardly at all from actually owning, owning a power drill. What you want to be able to do is drill a hole every once in a while when when you need to. 
So almost every household in, in, you know, almost every household everywhere has some kind of power drill. All right, I'll bet you've got one at home. I've got one at home. I probably have more than one. Uh, I probably have more than one one at home, and and this thing sits in my garage all the time, and it hardly ever gets used, and you know I can't ever find it. It's when I do want to use it, and and so that that decision for me to own a power drill is is not driven by my desire to own the power drill. It's driven by my desire again, like I said before, and like you said, I want to be able to drill a hole when I want to drill a hole. Well, right now. There's no other way for me to have access to a power drill other than to own one. Okay, and you know well, because so of because of technology, because of technology, that might actually be changing. Well, so so let's before we get onto that, which is a, a very interesting, somewhere we want to go today. I'm going to tell two quick stories. One is I also own several power drills. You and I are good friends. You know where my house is. I know where your house is. We're not exactly neighbors. Why is it that I don't use any of my power drills over 99% of the minutes in, in all of my days? You don't use your. There's no need for both of us to have a power drill. And yet I own at least two. You said you own multiple. Why are there four power drills between the two of us when 99% of the time there are no use for either of them in either household? And so there's, and this is these are people that know each other. These are people that go to work in the same place every day. Um, and so that's sort of befuddling. When I was growing up, though, we were um, neighbors with some with some good friends. My dad was was good friends with with a gentleman across the street. We only owned one lawnmower between the two households. Now that presents certain kind of problems if you want to move or whatnot. But how often am I trying to mow the lawn the same time as my neighbor? Almost never. And so that contract worked out beautifully and they were good friends and so they alternated when they filled up. But there are all these kind of transaction costs, right? When, when do you need it? When do I need it? Where do we store it? How do I get it whenever I want to mow and it happens to be in your garage? Who leaves the gasoline? full or, you know, what do you do after, after you've used it? And these are two good friends, so they, they jumped all those hurdles. And there's something different, apparently, about my relationship with you than it is my dad's relationship with his neighbor. Those are all fundamentally driven by transaction cost. Yeah, and, and they are. I mean, the, you know, the idea of sharing things in the way that you, you mentioned is extremely rare. I mean, a lawnmower is a perfect example. Of, of something and 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 you know it's, it's I've been thinking a lot about uh, you know this this subject uh, for the past uh, you know past couple of couple of months and and I've always wondered why my neighbors and I can't have a, a, a common lawnmower you know you could have you know maybe a group of four houses or six houses and um, you know you you would own this lawnmower between the between the group of you and it would just be understood or even it could be written down a contract that the, the, the lawnmower stays with the house, right? So, or the, or the fraction of the lawnmower stays with the house. So if I move, I lose, my, I lose the lawnmower, and whoever buys my house gets the lawnmower. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 the perplexing thing about, to me, about why these arrangements don't happen is that it's almost certainly that if I went in with my, with my neighbors, you know, three or four of my neighbors to buy a lawnmower, I'd probably buy a really good lawnmower. You know, I own a lawnmower. It's not a very good lawnmower. It's, it's really actually awful. I don't use it very often. I have a small yard. I don't need a lawnmower, but it, it's, it's a lot better. It would be a lot better if I had an extremely expensive lawnmower that I didn't have to pay for, that I shared the cost of and we shared the use of. Now, you know, neighbors don't, um, don't make those kinds of agreements very often. You just don't see that often. You know, I, I'd say that your, you know, your dad and his friends probably fairly unique uh, in, in doing something like that, and I, I really don't know why, but the answer is transaction costs. For some reason, you know, it might not be monetary at all. Uh, just, just, you know, for some reason, uh, it, it's just socially awkward to to do these kinds of things. And I, 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 I don't know, I don't know why, but that social awkwardness uh, is 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 a large enough transaction cost to to make us not mow our lawns that way. So, you know, how do we mow our lawns? We either we either buy our own lawnmower and mow our own lawns, all right, or we we share lawnmowers in different ways. So, um, you know, like I said, I mow my own lawn, uh, but a lot of people in my neighborhood hire a service to mow their lawn. And so in a, in a very real way, in a very economic way, the people that contract their lawns mowed, they are sharing a lawnmower. 
All right. So if you're, you know, if you're, um, um, you know, Smith Lawn Mowing Company, and and you do, you know, 100 lawns every summer or whatever, and you go around and you you mow lawns all the all, all the time in in a very real and a very economic way. The, 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 everyone who's using Smith Lawnmower Company is sharing their lawnmowers. All right, they're also sharing the labor to get the lawnmowers uh, done. And and in those instances, the the, the equipment that, that that someone who mows a hundred lawns uses is incredibly uh, efficient. They mow lawns really really fast. They do a good job. They've got all of the equipment necessary to make your make your lawn. Uh, uh, look look really really good if if you use them so so because of mysterious transaction costs that we don't really understand all right that that's basically how the sharing arrangement all right and I'm really stretching the definition of the word sharing here I know but that's that's really actually what's going on uh, and that's basically what any firm any firm does so you know think about Kinkos uh, you know Kinkos is just a way for several hundred people perhaps to share a copy machine right and so forth you know the the, the movie theater. Uh, is is a way for several thousand people in a community to share a great big screen to see movies with with a really loud sound system. So you know that's another way that 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 you know uh, that's another way that that transaction costs define uh, how firms behave. So you know when we talk about the sharing economy, you know Uber, whatever, um, you know this is just a, a a slightly different way of sharing things that wasn't possible before because of limits of technology and now that technology's changed we have these companies like uber that provide a platform uh to share rides with you know where individuals can share their car uh can share rides with one another in, in a way that wasn't in a way that wasn't possible a few years ago so you know again transaction costs are shaping the arrangements that we make as consumers and the arrangements that we make as firms all of that is driven by tra- – much of that is driven by transaction costs. It, it's almost because on the margin, I might be deciding as much whether I buy a lawnmower or pay somebody to mow my lawn. So I might be deciding just as much. Do I want to store this? Do I want to do the maintenance on it? Do I want to have it at my beck and call? I want to go mow at 1 in the morning that might be a bigger decision than fundamentally the engineering that went into the lawnmower, that the metal that and the plastics that were used to make the lawnmower. All those things are important mm-hmm. reasons that there is a price to the lawnmower, and yet that might be a tertiary concern by the time I get to buying uh, it. Yeah, it, it might be. I mean, in the, in, in the lawnmower case, the, 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 the neighbor sharing the lawnmower is almost an intermediate case. Right, and maybe maybe consumers, maybe almost everybody wants the, wants you know what we'd call a corner solution. All right, so I either want my loan I, I either want my own lawnmower. Sorry, I either want my own lawnmower. All right, that I have to, to completely store and completely take care of, and 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 as a result of that, I have access to it all the time. I don't have to mess with any arrangements with anybody else. All right, or I want to have to worry about nothing. Right, because if you use the Smith Lawnmower Company, you basically don't have to worry about yeah. anything. I, I just right? call you just them. pay them, you know, thirty dollars every two weeks or whatever it costs uh, to mow lawn. If 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 you've got the intermediate case where you share the lawnmower with with, with three or four neighbors, well, you, you still own a fourth of that lawnmower. So if there's maintenance, if there's storage, if there's all that kind of stuff that needs to be done, you still have to do that. So so maybe it's not social awkwardness, you know, maybe uh, that, that's causing this. Maybe maybe it's what we would consider to be more real and traditional economic considerations that stop those kind that stop those kinds of uh, kinds of arrangements. So we have three things that we could do. I can buy it, store it, maintain it, all the things I have to deal with. We could have a collective in my neighborhood, which you know, a minute ago you said four or six people at a time. There's no reason if I go and buy a two hundred fifty dollar push lawnmower that i mean there's dozens of people in my neighborhood there's no reason we couldn't all use that right. that's almost no reason at all that that wouldn't be the case of course part of that is like a peak use problem right, right. but that could be solved and but still there's transaction costs involved there i get it. okay well who has the lawnmower right now and oh right. i went and built it up there's no gas in it because because they just used it and i push all those transaction costs off onto smith mowing if i just Right, so it's almost like, why would my why would my dad and his neighbor have even done that in the first place? Didn't they know they could pay Smith and then not have to deal with either of those costs either? Well, who knows? And, and you, but you're, I think 
I don't know. I'm kind of, I kind of the the argument you made about some kind of social awkwardness. There is, there is some weirdness there. Like how, all but the closest people to me, would that feel a little bit awkward doing? Now is that because I fundamentally, deep down inside, understand that? Oh, well, I can just pay somebody to mow my lawn. Why would I go through the trouble of this? But imagine proposing that. Like, try this experiment when you go home. Knock on your neighbor's door and go, "Hey, let's buy a lawnmower together." Like they're having yeah. none of that, right? No, they, they would think I was strange. They, they would. They that would was be that was really strange. But what's what's even weirder about that leaves is, is is that if my neighbor came came over to my to my house tonight and said, "Hey, could I borrow your lawnmower?" Guess what? You'd, There's you'd, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, you'd say, "Yeah, it's, go ahead, take it." Yeah, you know, take it. So my my lawnmower is really bad, so that would never happen. So, but uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be concerned about that at all. Uh, the dumb thing is, I own a lawnmower. And my wife gets tired of me bewailing about having to store the darn thing in, in this place or that place in a, in a garage that I have too much stuff in. And the other things that I have too much of are things like power drills. So yeah. there's, there's a space trade-off that is going very poorly in, me, uh, in, in my particular house. You know, maybe the economist in me didn't make very efficient decisions or something. Uh, all this time I could have just been um, paying Smith to come, come on my lawn. So... Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. One of the things that uh, could, let me, one of the reasons I could choose to buy a lawnmower is I'd like to have access to it any time, and that reduces the uncertainty around when I could have the service. Um, is that fundamentally a transaction cost, or is it related to how transaction costs? Well, uh, I think it's a transaction cost. I think that's certainly a transaction cost, um, abs absolutely. Um, because... If there were a way that you could um, ensure that you would have access to a service when you wanted it, all right, you would be more likely to not want to own it. Does that does that make sense? Right. So, so uh, you know, let's uh, let me let me sort of jump in, you know, jump into this a little bit. I mean, in in order for there to be a market. Um, you, you basically need three things, all right? First, you need uh, what could be called triangulation, all right? So buyers and sellers need to be able to find one another, all right? The next thing that you need is, is you need some efficient way. Or it doesn't even have to be efficient. You need to have any way of transferring the good or service, all right? And then finally, you have to have some, some level of trust that, that exists, okay? And, um, you know, think about, you know, lawnmower is a good example, but, but, you know, in this context, maybe a better example would be your automobile, Right. Um, um, you know, I, I don't really want to own an automobile. What I what I want is I want to be able to drive somewhere when I want to go somewhere. All right. So just like my lawnmower, uh, my car sits still a lot. Right. It's sitting in the university parking lot right now, not not driving. You know, somebody could be joyriding in it right now. I wouldn't know. It wouldn't directly affect me at all because I'm not using it right now. But when I when I leave work. All right, it it I, it really needs to be there. So, and the same thing is true when I when I leave my house this morning to come to work. You know what 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 my car is doing at night doesn't matter to me at all, really. So, but when I get up and 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 leave for work at you know seven thirty or whenever I come up here, um, uh, that car better be there. And so I want it on command. Okay. And the reason I have to own a car is because at least right now there is not a way for me to find a car that I don't own and secure that car when I need it in a context that is, is, is reliable and trustworthy for me. So, um, you know, now along comes Uber, okay, which is uh, sort of a first step in, 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 solving, in, solving this, in, in, in solving this, in solving this problem. Um, you know, Uber is a very, very interesting thing because what Uber does is it is it reduces the transaction costs for these kind for these kinds of for these kinds of arrangements. So it is at least thinkable now, right? And I think probably ten years ago it may not have been thinkable, all right. Uh, but it is at least thinkable. It's at least possible for me to imagine a scenario where I don't own a car and whenever I want to go somewhere. I just somehow call a car, all right, probably 20 or 30 years ago, it might be a driverless car, all right, which is another, a whole other thing. Yeah. Uh, but where I could call a car 
to come and get me and take me where I where I want to go. All right, that can't happen now. All right, that's not practical now. It's thinkable now. Ten years ago, it was not even. I mean, this isn't anything I'd even thought about. Uh, uh, um, you know, ten years ago. Um, but but once this technology advances of of Uber and Uber like companies, all right, it's going to be more and more possible for people to not actually own a car. All right, then you'll have more room in your garage for power drills. All right, but but you know, many people right now think of of, of Uber as as uh, as as selling rides right that's what uber does so you know you even use the word as a verb well how are you going to get to the airport well i'm going to uber to the airport and what that means to everybody is that you're going to call somebody who is a driver all right who uses their personal car to drive people around when they're not otherwise using their car for their own for their own personal business so they're they're, they're basically you know monetizing or commodifying their unused time and their unused car time. So r right now, Uber does that. And, and think about how it solves the triangulation, transfer, and trust problem. Right? It does so in a very, very interesting way. So you have an app on your you know, aforementioned iPhone, everybody does, or you know, whatever kind of smartphone that you have, all right? and you can, you can join Uber. All right? You can let them know who you are and that you can have access to, to, to their services, which provides these, provides these rides. And through that app, you can match yourself up with people who drive. So if you need to go somewhere, if you need to go somewhere at you know, five o'clock tomorrow afternoon, you can schedule a ride and that will match you up with someone who has a car that's also free at five o'clock tomorrow and you can expect them to come and, 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 pick, and pick you up. The, 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 the transfer is, 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 is certain. Right, because there's all kinds of ways that, that Uber will ensure that if you schedule a ride, will actually show up and take you. So it's a pretty reliable way of getting of getting the ride. And then finally, the trust issue. And with Uber, this might be might be the hardest um, uh, th thing to crack. With with Uber, you're able that they have ways of actually making you trust the ride that you're getting. Right. So if if you're expecting um, you know, you can see a picture of, uh, you know, you can see a picture of your driver, right? So you know what the driver looks like. There'll be a description of the car, license plate number and stuff like that. So if you're, you know, if, 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 if you're expecting a, a, a 30 year old uh, redheaded person um, to show up and, and pick you up in a, you know, 2015 Honda Civic and take you to the airport, uh, and, and um, you know, somebody shows up that's a, um, you know, blonde-headed person or whatever uh, in, in a car that's not a Honda Civic, you probably wouldn't get in, right? So, so, so you know, with, with Uber, you're taking a ride with a stranger, but you're not taking a ride with a stranger. There's some kind of verification there that will support trust in the transaction, right? So, uh, you know, something that would be absolutely unthinkable of you doing in some context, which is getting in a stranger's car, is something that you will do with absolutely Monday. no thought uh, no thought at all, because you've got a context there that that promotes trust. And, you know, we think of Uber as selling rides, but what Uber really is is a platform that provides this kind of sharing among among people. All right. Uh, 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 and, you know, my guess is that in 10 or 20 years, people aren't going to think of Uber as a ride sharing. They're going to think of Uber as something much bigger. If you'll remember 20 years ago, Amazon sold books, and that's pretty much all Amazon sold, right? But we don't think of Amazon as a bookseller anymore. Amazon is, is a place where you can go get anything because Amazon never was selling books. Amazon was selling a, a, a platform, all right, that matched buyers and sellers together, provided an easy way of transferring the goods and services in a way that turned out to be incredibly trustworthy and reliable for the people for the people involved. So they moved very, very quickly from selling just books to basically everything uh, now. And I would predict that Uber would probably be the same way, right? So right now they're, they're just doing ride share, but in 10 years, uh, you know, a company like Uber, it might not be called Uber, but a company like Uber might bring you a drill that you need, right? So, so instead of you and I sharing our drill because we're friends, Right, uh, you and I might share our drills because I have a drill, and you need a drill, 
And so, you know, some little automated Uber car or drone or something like that comes and picks up my drill and takes it to you. And then when you're done with it, there'd be some mechanism of, of returning the drill to me. And, you know, the same thing might be true of, 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 of lawnmowers and, 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 and basically anything else. And, 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 and the, 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 the extent of which those kinds of sharing will go will depend ultimately on the transaction costs. Right, the power drill and the lawnmower to me seem like really, really easy things. Where you know someday it will be very, very normal for us not to own a lawnmower, but we'll have some sharing services. Not to own a power drill because we'll have some sharing service for it. You know, on the other end of the spectrum would be something like a toothbrush, right? You know, um, you know, even if you're very adamant at brushing your teeth, uh, you probably only brush your teeth, you know, four or five minutes a day. Uh, um, and so that means that basically 24 hours a day, your toothbrush is sitting there. Um, idle, all right? There's there's probably not going to be a way to to commoditize uh, and and monetize that idle time with a toothbrush. Uh, so, but but the reason for that is is transaction costs. Well, right? social awkwardness. If your neighbor well, walks up yeah. and says, "Can I borrow your power drill?" You don't hesitate. If you ask if you borrow your toothbrush, you'd say no. Yeah, that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. But, <laughs> so but there's you know, something again, there's something different about fundamentally. Yeah. I'm making a joke, but but seriously, those are personal items in a way that a power drill isn't, right? Right. That's exactly right. At the right. end of the day, I only care about, about toothbrushes um, at the stream of services. I don't have any attachment to that particular right. toothbrush. Exactly. And, but it, so maybe the, the solution there is like, you know, dissolvable toothbrushes or something that I use once and throw away. But, but that doesn't solve anything. There's a lot of things to unpack here. So the, the first thing is you said there are a lot of ways to define a firm. One of the ways that define a firm would be it's one, it's what solves these triangulation, transfer, and trust kind of thing. And so you said, well, the trust is the hard thing for Uber to solve. And, and in some ways, it's like, yeah, I, I follow that argument, except I've gotten on every plane I've ever flown on, and I never have once known the pilot's name. And half the time, I never even saw his or her face, and they were already in the cockpit doing their thing. I put my life... My, yeah. my family's life in the hands of, of these people that I never met. That's, that's really something powerful. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things that markets do, I think, really, really well, is they provide a context to, to basically instantly build trust in certain circumstances, right? One of the, uh, you know, I always like to try to trap my, my principal students in class and, and, and tell them about, you know, is it, is it ever smart to take candy from strangers? Right. And of course, the, the, the immediate answer to that is, well, no, you should never take candy from strangers because that's like, you know, it's just a, you know, yeah. it's, it's just it's just, it's just something axiomatic. we talk about. It's just, yeah, it's an axiom in, in our society. But yet I tell them, well, we do that all the time in certain in, in, in certain in certain contexts uh, that are very that are very, very specific. You know, you might uh, be visiting a grocery store that's handing out samples one afternoon. And if, if that were the case, and if you happen to have little kids, your, your kids might want to go have a bite of a chip or, or you know, whatever they're, whatever they're giving away. And, of course, in every case, as a parent, you're going to say, sure, go up to that person and, and take, their, take their food. And, and you know, that, that's a stranger, right? That, that is, in, that, that is in, in, in every definition of the word. That's a stranger, all right? Even in a broader sense, when you buy a package of M&Ms, that was, that's been handled by a multitude of people that you don't know. You know, in fact, no one that you know probably has handled that M and M. But yet, we buy it, we open it up, we eat it. We don't think anything, we don't think anything of it. So, one of the things that markets do is is it provides these contexts for strangers to cooperate with one another in a way that's extremely trustworthy. All right, that that building of trust is a transaction costs where. Um, as the price of trust goes down, there's going to be more, the extent of the market is going to go up, and we're going to have more possibilities for exchange. That's exactly what Uber does. So, right, among the other, other things that Uber does is, is Uber provides uh, um, a, a platform to build trust instantly among two strangers, because it's both strangers, right? Because you're, you're inviting someone. If you're an Uber driver, you're inviting a stranger into your car too. So this, so this certainly, you know, this certainly goes, goes both ways. So Uber for, provides a platform for there to be a market for that, for that trust. And that enables us to conduct transactions that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. It's just simple law of demand. Costs go down, transaction costs go down, all right? The number of exchanges goes up. And uh, that's, that's, what, that's what technology and innovation has given us 
through through time. It's 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 one of the most important and overlooked uh, aspects of, of of innovation. We always see innovation as, as as something that's always coming from either science, technology, engineering, something like that. But you know, innovation can come from these kinds of arrangements too. Where, where 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 trust is is built. Of course, it's the you know it's the technology that makes it happen. It's the smartphone that makes it happen. All right, but that's still a relatively small part of what's going on. I think. Well, and it's it's hard to see because I can point to oh look we have wheels and an engine and now we have a car. The technology created that, uh, and then you don't. Under- Uber does not advertise that they reduce transaction costs, yet that's, that's exactly know, what they're that's doing. Exactly, that's exactly and what only they're doing. what they do, uh, but they don't advertise that. So it's difficult, I think, to see from the outside that these kind of innovations are just as powerful, if not more, but because they're never called that in an advertisement. Well, it's, it's, it's sneaky. It's hard to see. It's, it's hard for us to see the value in that. Yes. Um, you know, e- economists can. All right, but I, I, I think even still, I, 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 well, yeah, I, th- I think a, a, a lot of it, um, um, you know, we, we certainly undervalue those kinds of, of, of innovations. All right, you know, most of the time we think of, of an innovation is is something that's you know bigger or faster, or something like that. So you know, an, an, an innovation in, in a car would make that car go faster. An innovation in an automobile would make that car get better fuel mileage or something like that. And we would see those, we would define those things very, very easily as innovations as, as an, and as improvements. But a platform like Uber is also an innovation in transportation that doesn't have anything to do with the characteristics of the car. All right, but Uber makes every car that exists right now much more valuable than it was before because they have the opportunity now to be used instead of setting in your driveway, instead of setting in, uh, instead of setting in your garage, and that 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 is potentially that is potentially u- huge. Yeah. All right. That is potentially huge because um, you know we can we can you know we can have transportation much much cheaper, perhaps, if this if this takes off. So this trust thing is really important because. We just said, okay, well, don't take candy from strangers, but it's just fine to buy candy from strangers. And I, right. <laughs> seriously, and that, that's really counterintuitive. I think people would, uh, would uh, wrinkle their eyebrows at you if you tried to say that to them. And yet we know that's true. And part of what's amazing about that, and I think one of the things that economics tries to teach people that they're very resistant to learn, is that self-interest isn't that much of a problem. And it's exactly situations like this. If somebody comes up to you, you don't know them, you've never seen them, and they hand you what looks like a perfectly good candy bar, you're probably not going to eat that. If somebody comes up to you and says, here, I have this tray of candy bars, and I'm trying to sell them, and, you know, will you give me some money and then pick out one of these candy bars, you immediately know what their motivation is. Their motivation is to make some money so they can go purchase things that they have these candy bars, but they'd rather have something else. They want to trade you uh, the money that they can go get something else. And so the trust then, it seems counterintuitive, but when somebody comes to you and says, I want to sell you this, it's probably because they want to sell you this. And you, you can trust them in as much as that works. So that's something that's really fascinating. Firms do that. And I, I think we live in a culture now that's like increasingly suspicious of firms. Um, but I think firms want to sell you money. And we'd like to live in a world where everybody does everything altruistically. That's not realistic. Right. And, and that's part of why firms are actually better than altruism in some ways because it crystallizes your motivation. I, 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 yeah, I, I think so. I and mean, it's an interesting point. I mean, I'll, I'll buy Girl Scout cookies and eat them, all right? But if, if, if someone came to my door and handed me a package of Chips Ahoy, I'm not going to eat them. No way. <laughs> I mean, no way. It doesn't make sense, right? No, no. And that, that's, that's, something that's, that's something that's really, really bizarre. You know, you, you, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is you mentioned the transfer thing. The Uber solves transfer in a way that you don't think of them having solved transfer, right? Um, you, you called it, they solve transfer um, uh, reliably or credibly or something is what you said. But I've had this experience. I go and I call an Uber and the first guy uh, accepts it and he starts driving toward me and I can see on the little map, here comes the car, it's, it's seven minutes away or whatever. And then he cancels partway through. And who knows why, you know, I have no idea why. Uh, Maybe he realized there's lots of traffic between me and him. He didn't want to do that. And Uber, without me doing anything, just 
reopens it, assigns me to another driver, and now uh, a woman uh, agrees to this, and then here she shows up seven minutes later. That's Uber solving transfer. It doesn't look like it, right? right. Because Uber says, what you care about is a ride. You don't care about which of these individuals, you know, presuming that they're, you know, similar quality for whatever, however we'd measure that safety and performance of the car and whatnot. Uh, so they solved the transfer problem for me. Whereas if I had called individual A and said, A, come give me a ride. And he said, sure. And then he calls me halfway through and says, oh, man, like my, my kid's sick. I'm going to have to cancel on you. The transfer is broken right there. Uber steps in and solves that. And that's. That's something that's really fantastic that I don't think anybody has teased out about Uber is it's not just solving the trust, which is amazing. It's solving the transfer problem, right? And and that is a traditional like brick and mortar firm. I think I want to buy something. I want to buy a power drill. One thing is they solve triangulation. My first thought is I'm going to go to Walmart or Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever. I know where it is. And then they solve the transfer by holding the drill in the building yeah. for me until I go and get it. So this way of solving triangulation, of literally going, Uber knows where the car is and it knows that I'm standing on this particular sidewalk, triangulation solved, and now I want to get this drive here and he starts coming here and he cancels and then someone else comes and gets me, transfer solved. That's a completely different way of solving it than, than Walmart has. Yeah, but, but they're doing the same thing. It just manifests itself in different ways. So exactly. you, know, you want to go to Walmart, United, or whoever, and buy bananas, and, and you go there, and the bananas are there, right? You don't have any idea what their supply problem was, right? You don't have I mean, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the company that they usually get the bananas from canceled on them, and so they still have bananas there, so you know they've solved that problem somehow. They always have everything. It's not like... You know, it's not like all these relationships are always constant. It's very, very unusual for, for, for a grocery store, for instance, to be out of anything. So, so there is an entire network behind a brick-and-mortar store that solves all these problems as well. Behind the scenes, we don't see them, right? Now, the way Uber does it and the way your example is, that's a very dramatic way of solving it. And, 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 and one of the things that's instructive about that is that if you're in business, if you're a firm, all right, that, uh, that serves the public, that expects to sell things to the public, you have to have the expertise to solve these supply chain problems, right? That's one of the things that firms do, right? That's, that's, one, of the firms th that's one of the things that firms do, right? They, 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 they match up the, the, the seller with the buyer, all right? And the retail and wholesale, they stand in between maybe the ultimate producer and the ultimate buyer. And, and all of these problems that crop up, with cancellations, bad weather, whatever, they, they, they solve these things behind, behind the scenes, right? And that's the value that they add to, that's the value that they add to the, to the economy, right? And Uber does the same thing. So I, I was thinking as we're talking this whole time about Uber and cars. So most people pay thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for a car. And then they pay hundreds or thousands of dollars on, on maintenance. And I got to buy tires, and I got to put gas in it, and I have to do this, that, and the other thing. The cost of owning a car so that I can have on-demand use of an automobile, and then I have to drive the darn thing, is really high. Oh, it's staggering. It, it's I mean, just mind-blowingly high. And and then I have to find a place on property near my house to park the thing, and then I got to find property near where I work to drive the thing. And then I have a transaction coordination problem when I need this car, but my wife needs a car and, you know, she wants this car for that reason or the other. And then now we have to figure out, okay, well, Tuesday, I'm gonna drive this car to work and, and you drive the other car and then Wednesday, we'll do it the other way. Right? There's a lot of people solve that just by owning cars that are his and hers. Um, but there's lots of problems there. It just it just screams for the kind of thing that could easily be solved. And so I look at Uber. Uber rides are not that cheap. Um, and for whatever reason, whether it's you mentioned, uh, you know, the uncertainty of being able to call them whenever I need them. Um, it's really surprising if we don't, it will be surprising if we don't go down that road and sort of eventually get everybody to, to renting cars all the time than it will be if they end up keeping them just based on the extraordinary cost. I mean, it's tens of thousands of dollars a year. It's got to be. Or thousands, maybe not tens of thousands. But. Well, it depends on how 
expensive car is. Yeah. Um, you know, depreciation is is a cost too, and that could be, you know, for 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 a really nice car, that could easily be ten grand a year. Well, I mean, think about yeah. that. The present value of the money that you're spending yeah. on that, the depreciation of the car, those things are related. Like, that's a, that's a very high cost as well. Mm-hmm. well. I mean, I would say stay tuned. Yeah, absolutely. Right on that, because th- there's going to have to be a, a lot of, um, um, you know, the, the the sort of utopian world that a lot of people think about when they think about cars and not owning cars anymore. You know, it's, you'd have driverless cars, and you'd have you know on demand calling a car uh, to come and to come and pick you up whenever you want to go somewhere. There, there's there's going to be all kinds of problems in that, and 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 you know we, we we're having technology now that's not um, that's 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 new, right? That that represents uh, possibly an opportunity for massive change in how we do personal. Uh, you know, personal transportation. But on the other hand, uh, you know, things aren't the way they are right now for no reason whatsoever. Right. So, you know, is it just tr- high transaction costs that is causing me to own a car instead of basically somehow on demand renting one? Is that the only consideration? Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that. I can think of one other thing, right? Um, and cars are often status symbols. And so that would be something that as that erodes, because it almost certainly will in a world where we can, uh, I, don't, I don't care how fancy your car is, like look at all the, all the transaction costs and all the actual costs that I'm saving by being able to go and, and rent a car. Like you driving a nice car and me having all my time and space and money, it, that isn't going to be a good trade. But right now it is. You know, I, I drive a car that's over 20 years old, so maybe I'm not the person who should be should be speaking to this, but I understand, you know, if somebody comes out and have a nice car or something, that is probably part of what's keeping people from, uh, from renting the car all the time. Right. There's go ahead. Well, I, I mean, social norms de- define that, you know, cause if you, if you save money on transportation needs and you can buy status other places, other ways, right. If this becomes, if the, you know, if, if you save, you know, ten grand a year on cars. You know, think about the other status symbols you could buy with that. <laughs> right. So, so you 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 have that. Um, you know, it, it, it might be. You know, it, it might be the case that the that the social norms actually reverse. Right. If this yeah. becomes common and accepted, there might be a time in the future when you're actually looked down upon if you have your own car. Uh, that that's almost it's it's not unthinkable to me, but that's almost unthinkable to me. But you know we don't know the future. We don't we don't know how these things are going to evolve and, and emerge. And you know the whole point of this conversation is is to let listeners know that transaction costs are incredibly important components of all the change that we see around. Mm-hmm. They're not the only driver of these things, but they are a main driver, I think, of a lot of of a lot of what we see. So I want to take us in a related but but slightly different um, direction here. One of the things about lowering these transaction costs is those are almost certain to be things that lower our, our dead weight loss, our just loss to society. And parking lots would be one really obvious example of that. Uh, the number and the kind and the quality of cars, right, the number of cars in this uh, you know, sort of post car ownership world probably drops dramatically, but the quality of them probably rises dramatically. We could think of lots of good ways, lots of good outcomes that would be from that. But uh, I heard a recent interview with uh, Andrew McAfee from MIT, and he talks about an idea called dematerialization, which is there's been this trend in um, developed countries towards producing as much or more but using fewer physical materials, which is, that's a miracle. And the fact that that isn't on the news every day, I I never heard of that before. I heard that interview. That's mind-blowing. And then Mm -hmm. that's sort of a travesty of the news cycle, but that's neither here nor there. That can keep going, right? Um, Imagine a world where there are no parking lots effectively because I don't own a car and I don't drive to work and I don't have to worry about 
driving and parking and storing my car and then walking into work because I just get dropped off at the front door by by Uber. And then that parking lot, now that's valuable space because parking lots are constructed near things people want to be right. in. And that could lower the cost of houses, that could lower you know, the cost of buildings, that could increase the number of businesses that we have, on and on and on, all these good things that we could think of happening. And on top of that, use fewer materials to have more more stuff, more yeah. and better stuff. So it, it's really fascinating that you can think of just sort of how broad transaction costs can be applied. Yeah, and I, and I, I think it's, it's more marvelous than you even think. Um, You're saying I undersold it. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I understand why you called things like parking lots deadweight losses, right? But, you know, right now, parking lot's not really a deadweight loss. No, that's right. right? It's, it's, absolutely, it's necessary. It's absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my house has a garage. You know, that's not a deadweight loss for me. I actually need a garage, right? I've got to store my cars. I have to store my power drill. I have to store my, the things that I put in my garage. They, they need to go there, right? And the reason I have a garage on my house is, is again, not a deadweight loss. It's because I have to store all these things that I own that I don't use very often. And it's basically almost the definition of what you put in something uh, in a garage. As, as these transaction costs to, to basically renting instead of owning go down and I rent more and own less, then the parking lot can be released to other uses. Right. Right? It doesn't mean it was a deadweight loss before. Right. If if we somehow kept the parking lots, then maybe you could think of that as a dead weight loss. But uh, you know, my 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 garage then can then can then be transformed into something else. Parking lots can then be transformed in in, in into something else, and and um, um, you know that 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 creates a a lot of really really good things. You can spend your money on something else. That, right. Spend our taxes on something else. You know, cities can be more dense. Without needing without needing parking lots, without needing extensive road systems, which we might need less of if we had you know especially autonomous cars in some way, so uh, uh, everything could be made more efficient than it is right now because of the reduction in transaction costs. We could live in a world where we have more for less is an unimaginable dream, except that it it's very real. It's here, uh, and how that isn't a primary story is beyond me. Um, so I was thinking uh, more of the nature of, uh, you know, dead to late loss, not so much in terms of my garage itself, but these other kind of things that cause me to, um, you know, sort of unnecessarily have to store things or search for things or these kind of things could potentially be thought. And maybe I hadn't thought about that very much, so maybe I need to uh, think carefully about that. But there's there's something to be gained there. And that, of course, is an efficiency. That's an efficiency gain, hence why I labeled that uh, dead weight loss. So I want to bring this in for a landing because we're, we're over an hour now. Um, the last thing that I want to sort of touch on is we've talked a lot about firms. We've talked about markets. We've talked about goods. Um, and so we've really explored how we view ownership of goods and uh, coordination differently. Do you think this impacts the way we eventually view jobs, employment, and income? Well, almost certainly would, right? Because, you know, I, I, I mean, just, just with any, you know, creative destructive process, which is, um, you know, what, what reductions in transaction costs can give us, the, 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 the kind of work that we do is is certainly going is certainly certainly going to change. Um, so what what do you think? Do you think this is going to change the way we view jobs? Yeah. So I'm really interested in that because one version of this story is I own a drill and you don't own a drill, and then I make money off of owning a drill and then using Amazon's new drone flying service that flies. A drill. So that's one way. I mean, in in a, a really extreme and I. I would be loath to make this as a prediction, but like one really extreme version of this is like different resources and, and capital um, get distributed kind of evenly. And then we all kind of own different combinations of those. And then we 
have this income that's based on that. And then the work that we do is, is somewhat less important, right? That'd be an extremely radical version of the story, but like you can picture it, right? And so one of the way that I thought about that is, okay, how are jobs going to change? Well, we just talked about where does the firm begin? Where does the market end is in part determined by these little, you call them bubbles that how can we coordinate transaction costs uh, or minimize transaction costs? Well, if we live in a world where we increasingly reduce transaction cost, in theory, and I haven't thought about this prediction very much, so I could be very wrong about it, but in theory, right, we could see this sort of more market type behavior and less firm type behavior. And I think a critic of me would say, well, but ex Amazon's the biggest firm now in some ways. And they're reducing transaction costs. So I could be very wrong about that. But you can also see a world where when the transaction costs go down and the way that firms coordinate to reduce the transaction cost um, could also go down, get smaller. Um, that's, again, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to make that as an actual prediction. But it is one way I could see jobs and the nature of work changing. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, certainly. Um, you know, I, I don't think that we'd have any any way to predict um, exactly where where this will where this will end up. You know, the world is different today than it was, you know, than anybody would have thought it was going to be ten years ago. In way, you know, it just is it, you know it's, it's very very difficult to see progress. I think, and especially as it's happening all around yeah. you, um, and it's hard to put your finger kind of on how that is even happening now, let alone what it's going to be like in the right. future. So, right. Excellent. So my guest today has been Rex Pieski. Rex, thanks for being a part of the Econ Buff. Thank you very much.